All right, I think we've got a good number here. We'll go ahead and get started and then I'll admit everyone as they come in. Um, first of all, hello. Uh, welcome to our second class of the year. Um, this one is an intro to homeopathy. Uh, leading us through the lecture tonight is gonna be Dr. Pamela Herring. Um, Dr. Herring is a licensed uh, naturopathic doctor with a specialty certification in classical homeopathy. Um, in 1980, excuse me, 1988, she founded the Naturopathic Clinic of Concord and practiced there until 2015, at which point she, uh, the practice moved and she opened her current office on North State Street in Concord. Through her over 30 years of experience, she's treated an impressive array of ailments utilizing gentle, non-invasive, and effective treatments. I'm sure there'll be questions as we learn through this evening, and Dr. Herring encourages you to post them in the tech chat, text chat, and she will do her best to answer them as we go along. Additionally, the Concord Food Co-op will be selling discounted remedy kits using a list that Dr. Herring has provided. We currently have two different preset kits, one of six of the most popular remedies and another of 12. Um, they're both about 20% off of the retail price. We'll also be offering a custom kit um, in case there are specific remedies that interest you, um, uh, sorry, more specifically interest you. Um, for any of the preset kits or the custom kit, um, please call the store and you can ask for me. Um, my name is Zane, or you can send me an email at zane at concordfoodcoop.coop and I'll post that in the chat um, towards the end of the class. So without further, excuse me, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Pamela Herring and invite her to take it away. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. I am uh, uh, delighted to see so much interest in homeopathy. And I welcome you all tonight. Um, this gentle, this safe, this really um, wonderful form of medicine um, has had its ups and downs. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history um, to start, but let me uh, share my screen and we'll dive right in. Okay. So what we're going to cover tonight, hopefully, <laughs> time allows, a uh, brief history of homeopathy, homeopathy's place in the world today and its place in the United States, uh, principles of homeopathy. Uh, we're going to talk about the difference between acute and constitutional homeopathy. Those are sometimes confusing issues for people and uh, the, what the medicines are made from, the kingdoms, plant, animal, mineral, and potency and dosing and how they made, um, and how does it work? Then we're gonna go through all the first aid remedies that are in a basic kit, uh, a basic 50 remedy kit. We're gonna do about 30 of those remedies, hopefully <laughs> we can get through them all. And uh, I have, um, highlighted some of the uh, basic flu remedies, the change of season when people get sick, we'll highlight some of those remedies, and then we'll talk about some references and where you go from here. So Dr. Samuel Hahnemann was the founder of homeopathy and he was born in 1755 and lived to a ripe old age of about 88, uh, passed away in 1843. And he was a German scholar. He was a physician, he was a chemist, and he was well-versed in the medicine of his day. He was fluent in seven languages, at least. Some people say nine. Um, and he was appalled at the way medicine was uh, being conducted in his day. The physicians of his day were using purging and bloodletting, um, leaching and using toxic doses of substances that oftentimes would actually be the cause of the patient's death. He left his medical practice. That's how um, disenchanted he was with it. And he became a medical translator. And uh, among some of the things he was translating, he came across a statement about cinchona bark. Cinchona bark uh, was used to uh, treat malaria in those days. And what he read was that the reason it worked was because it was the bitter herb. And he thought, well, you know, from his medical experience, he, he realized that 
if that were true, then all bitter remedies or bitter herbs would cure malaria. So he wanted to find out really why cinchona bark worked. So he thought he'd take it. He, so he took, that was the first remedy that was quote unquote proven. Um, he took cinchona bark and what he noticed was that he developed uh, chills and weakness and fevers and sweats, which are precisely the symptoms of malaria. And so he, from that, he deduced that that's, it was a similar, that, that this herb produced a similar disease to malaria, and therefore it would be able to treat malaria. This principle he called the law of similars or like cures like. And uh, he did find also that, that uh, authors such as Paracelsus and Hipp Hippocrates uh, referred to this principle in their writings as well. So Dr. Hahnemann began experimenting with other substances too. And over time, he interested uh, his colleagues, some of his colleagues who were more open-minded to um, also do provings. These provings are when a person takes the substance and then you record all the symptoms that come up because of that herb or uh, that medicine from, from its source. Um, so they were all recording these and developed quite an extensive materi medica. They had well over hundred remedies that they had proven over time. And, um, and homeopathy was beginning to catch on in Germany. And this was, uh, and at the same time, Dr. Hahnemann was quite stern about his opinion uh, of the medicine of his day. And so he was not very popular amongst uh, the majority of his colleagues. Um, to the point where he was actually exiled or forced to leave Leipzig and then ultimately forced to leave Germany. And he went to France and spent the rest of his life in France where he received a little warmer reception. Uh, he remained there until his death. While he was still in Germany, however, he wrote a book called The Organon. And the first edition um, was written um, see, I think in about, um, actually, I forgot <laughs> the year actually that it was written, but it was written before he went to France. And then in France, he revised it. There were, there were six editions in all. And we use, today we use the sixth edition, which was, um, you know, the translation, translation wasn't really available until as late as uh, uh, 19, uh, 1821, I think it was, 1921. Um, now this book called The Organon of, of the Medical Art or The Ar Organon of Medicine um, really lays down the principles of healing. And I'm gonna give us a sample of some of the aphorisms. It was divided into aphorisms all through the book. Uh, but it gives you a little bit of a sense of, of how Dr. Hahnemann was really a purist. Oh, it was completed. The, the first edition was published in 1810. There we are. And the sixth edition was completed in 1842, but not published till 1921. And my date's a little confused. Some have said that the Organon may in time be widely recognized as one of the most important books in the entire history of medicine because it introduces a successful system of medicinal therapy that contrasts radically with everything previously taught uh, at that time. The first aphorism, the physician's highest calling, his only calling is to make sick people healthy, to heal as it is termed. The second one says, the highest ideal of therapy is to restore health rapidly, gently, and permanently to remove and destroy the whole disease in the shortest, surest, least harmful way, according to clearly comprehensible principles. And then the fifth one 
includes discover the exciting cause in acute disease and the underlying cause in chronic disease. This is really a basic principle of naturopathy too, is to um, treat the cause of disease, not just to um, suppress symptoms, which is often what drugs will do. To move the, the pictures so I can see the text here. There we go. So there was a rise of homeopathy in uh, the United States, um, really toward the end of uh, Dr. Hahnemann's life. His son actually came to the United States and practiced homeopathy. Um, this rise of uh, homeopathy was, was actually quite pronounced and the um, the epidemics uh, that occurred during those days of cholera and typhoid and yellow fever, uh, the homeopaths never lost patients. They had great success and that just drove the popularity of homeopathy up and it, it caused quite a stir. The American Medical Association was formed in retaliation more or less uh, to the homeopath, homeopathic movement. Um, the first home American homeopathic organization was formed in 1844. And um, by 1900, there were over 100 homeopathic hospitals, 20 plus homeopathic medical colleges, and over 1,000 homeopathic pharmacies. So what happened? In in 1921, there was a report that came out called the Flexner Report. And in that report, they, um, they demanded that the medical schools all took homeopathy out of their programs, that they, out of their schools. And they were no longer allowed to teach homeopathy. And not only that, they effectively banned medical doctors from even consulting with a homeopath. Uh, to the point that they prohibited one man from consulting with a homeopath who happened to be his wife. So that's how strict they were about the whole business. So, so for quite a number of years after that, homeopathy, you know, lost its, uh, its, um, its grip, you might say, and declined to quite an extent until about uh, 1960. And that's when um, there was kind of a renaissance in homeopathy. And uh, this happened after a Greek homeopath came to the United States and uh, started teaching some of the medical doctors in California. And then um, they just uh, started spreading the word and it got out and and by the 1980s, it was, there was quite a resurgence during that time. So there's been also quite a bit of research done on homeopathy. Uh, the one example is Lancet, uh, which is the popular uh, state-of-the-art medical journal of, of the United Kingdom, uh, had an article. This was probably back in the 80s. Or early 90s. And in this article, they were comparing uh, placebo to homeopathics in terms of treating asthma. And the title of that article was that asthma, um, homeopathy bests uh, placebo in treating asthma. And I can vouch for that because over the years, I've treated many cases of asthma very, very successfully. And often within a month or two, the asthma was pretty much gone. Um, I had one, my first asthma case uh, was a five-year-old boy who was on 10 drugs. He was about to start on immunoglobin shots and he was going to children's hospital every month. And the mother came kind of in desperation. And um, basically I took him off uh, dairy and sugar and uh, put him on some herbs like echinacea and for immune support and 
and gave him his homeopathic remedy. And um, within about a week, I got a phone call and the mother was saying, uh, she took him off all his medication. And I thought, oh boy, uh-oh. I said, okay, well, just call me if he gets a fever or if he gets any wheezing. And uh, she just called me each week to tell me that he would wake up in the morning just covered with mucus. And I said, well, that's the best thing that could happen. So he was expelling all that uh, mucus from his lungs. And once, it, once that was cleared out, that was the end of his asthma. And um, that was uh, in the late 80s or early 90s when I first started my practice. And just before I closed that office in, um, let's see, 2000, what was it? Um, 15, that mother came to my office to tell me that her son who had been five years old at the time, four years old, was now 20 something and has never had asthma. She said, never got asthma again. That was the end of it. So that's how, just a glimpse of how effective and how safe, you know, I don't always recommend they take them off all their drugs like that, but until we see some results, but it worked in his case. And uh, if he had enough immune support that it really kept him, um, he was okay. So, um, the legality, there are no laws preventing lay people from using homeopathy. However, a practitioner uh, is required to have a medical license <clears throat> that includes homeopathic medicine. The Naturopathic Doctors Practice Act in New Hampshire, which was passed in 1995, does include homeopathics. So we um, are free to prescribe them. Um, as far as the education of homeopaths, uh, homeopathy is taught in all the naturopathic schools. Some of the uh, osteopathic schools also have homeopathic courses. And, um, and then there are schools strictly for homeopathy, like the New York School of Homeopathy, which is, I think now it's an online course possibly, uh, then, or the New England School of Homeopathy in Massachusetts. And there are many others too around the world and around the country. Now, let's see, I have to move these pictures again to get at my arrows. There we go. Maybe I can do it this way. No. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So some compelling truths about homeopathy, just some facts. These were taken from the American Institute of Homeopathy website. Um, homeopathy is a system of medicine used by over 500 million people and tens of thousands of physicians worldwide. Homeopathy is the number two complementary alternative medicine in the world, according to the World Health Organization. That was a surprise to me. Uh, healthcare in France is rated by the World Health Organization as the very best in the world. It's interesting to note that 95% of all French general practitioners, dermatologists, and pediatricians, and 75% of all midwives use homeopathy for their patients. Another factoid, in 2011, the Swiss government, with the help of a panel of European scientists, conducted an official and comprehensive study of homeopathy. The conclusion of that study is that especially homeopathy is effective under effective under Swiss conditions, it's safe and as far as could be judged from the trial situation, also cost efficient. Those were cut and pasted, that didn't quite go together. <laughs> but um, on Tuesday, March 29th, 2016, the Swiss government officially took the additional important steps of recognizing homeopathy as having equal standing with ordinary conventional medicine. Another surprise. <laughs> Research scientists in 12 separate laboratories in the United States, Russia, France, and Italy and India have confirmed that homeopathy may well be the first form of nanomedicine, albeit natural, ever discovered. And we're gonna talk about how the remedies are made and why they're considered nanomedicine. 
In addition to 200 years of positive clinical outcomes and the extensive positive evidence for homeopathy uh, found in reliable public records, there are literally hundreds of basic science, preclinical and clinical trials, including very large observational studies showing homeopathy to be effective, an effective intervention. So just to point out, you know, the United States is a little bit behind, I think some of these European countries in terms of their acceptance of this alternative form of medicine. So let's go to some of the principles of homeopathy. So there's a law of similars, which we talked about a little bit, the, the, the law that like things cure like things. And we'll uh, have a chance to see some of that as we go along through the remedies. Um, symptoms are the way that we uh, are what we use as a guide to finding the remedy. So uh, the symptoms in a holistic way would include the mental, the emotional, and the physical symptoms. Um, and you'll see as we go along how that plays out. And then there are Herring's laws, no relation. My name has two R's, uh, but the, Herring, the laws uh, put together by Constantine Herring, who was an American homeopath. homeopath. Uh, and this was all developed through observation that when things heal, they go from the head downward and they go from the inside to the outside, so the, the deeper organs to the more superficial organs, like the skin. And they go from the organs of most importance to the organs of least importance. And healing goes in the reversed order of the appearance of the symptoms. So for example, if somebody uh, brings a child in with eczema, and if we suppress that eczema with steroids, then it will drive that disease deeper into the lungs oftentimes, and they will develop asthma. So when I'm treating a child with asthma and I learn that they've had eczema, I will tell the parent that not to be surprised as we go along in the treatment that the eczema will come back out as they're getting better with the asthma because it's following that, that law of uh, going from not only the inside to the outside, but from the organs of most importance to the least. So we're gonna drive it out of the deeper organs like the lungs to the skin. So when we see a skin eruption after taking a remedy, oftentimes we look at that as a real plus that they're moving in the right direction toward health. Whoops. So what are the remedies made from? <clears throat> let's, get, let's put that over here. So uh, the remedies are varied. They range from snake venom to squid ink to windflower to salts. And uh, they are from all of the, the three main kingdoms, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the mineral kingdom, which is the periodic table of elements, and, and certainly the compounds that are made from the elements, and virtually anything can made, be made into a remedy. Any substance can be made into a remedy by cereal dilution, by making a tincture and then cereal, serially diluting it. Many poisons are used as medicine, uh, toxins, uh, venoms, um, and plant plant toxins um, are some of the best medicines we have. So they're made by cereal dilution and potentization. So uh, for example, <clears throat> it'll be perhaps one part remedy to 10 parts of a diluent. The diluent might be water, it might be alcohol, or it might be a mixture of the two. Um, that would be a 1x remedy. If we took one part of that, to 10 parts of water, one part of that dilution to one, 10 parts of water, then we'd have a 2X. 
and so on, up to 6x, the most common serial dilutions in an acute remedy kit will be a 6x, a 12x, or a 30x, or they could be a 6c, 12c, 30c. So what are the c's? The c's are the centesimal scale. So one part remedy to 100 parts of diluent would be a 1c. And one part of that dilution to 100 parts of water would be a 2c. We commonly use 200C for a high potency remedy, and those are mostly used for constitutional prescribing um, and, and not for acute prescribing, although occasionally for acute. Uh, but I recommend that um, people who are beginning to use remedies start with the, the C potencies because they're strong enough to do a, a good job and, and uh, the 6C, the 12C, and the 30C, or the 6X, 12X, 30X. And I believe the kits that uh, Zane was talking about, I believe they're all 30C remedies. Now we also do dilutions of one part of uh, the remedy, the substance to a thousand parts of water, which is a one M. M stands for a thousand in the, um, uh, Roman numerals. So we'll commonly use a 10M, a 50M, a CM, which is 100,000, and MM, which is a million dilution. It's so even after just 12 dilutions, we're beyond Avogadro's number, which is defines the size of a molecule. So I can't seem to find a good place to put the pictures, sorry, I have to keep moving them around so I can see the screen. After 12 serial dilutions of one to 10, we have an infinitesimal amount, a very, very, very tiny amount, less than a molecule, as I said. And uh, between each dilutions, Dr. Hahnemann would succuss the remedies. He would, you know, just bang them on a book, you know, just in the, in the vial and succuss it. And there was something about that succussion that, that increased the energy of the, of the uh, remedies. So in his words, he said, this very subtle dose, which contains almost nothing but the spirit-like medicinal force released and freed can bring about solely by its dynamic power results impossible to obtain with crude med medicinal substances, even in massive doses. We are beginning to understand, to better understand the importance of these diluted remedies as we learn about nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles uh, that have an effect on the vital force. When we do these dilutions, it's now been discovered that nanoparticles are left in that water uh, after with each dilution, and those nanoparticles have an effect on the vital force before people thought it was just uh, placebo, but now they're actually, with the help of these electron micro microscopes, you can see that there's actually something there. So what is the vital force? <clears throat> Homeopaths believe that as long as you're alive, there exists within you a living, intelligent energy that's responsible for healing and maintaining balance in your body, mind, and emotions. This energy is called the vital force. And the idea has been shared by many cultures throughout the world using names such as ki, prana, mana, life force, chi. Although the vital force is intangible, its effects are readily apparent. Examples are the immune system. It not only operates at a physical level, but on an emotional and mental level as well. For example, a severe grief can have a dramatic effect on the vital force or vitality of the body and initiate illness. Again, in Dr. Hahnemann's own words, in the state of health, the spirit-like vital force, well, he called it the dynamis, dynamis, animating the material human organism reigns in supreme sovereignty. Without the vital force, the material organism is unable to feel or act or maintain itself. Without the vital force, the body dies, decomposes and reverts to its chemical constituents. So we often will say we're, you know, we're trying to uh, 
uh, we're treating at the level of the vital force. We're trying to improve the vital vital energy of a person with the remedy. And when you take the constellation of symptoms and find that remedy that matches, it somehow seems to neutralize or it just um, uh, works to uh, enhance that vitality, that vital force. Sorry about that. I couldn't figure out how to erase that. This <laughs> slide was from an old, older program that had this. Anyway, uh, this book, uh, Principles and Practice of Treatment by Andrew Lockie and, and Geddes, was a wonderful book. And I took many of the um, pictures from this book uh, for the slides. And so we're gonna just dive right into um, the remedies now. Uh, but before we do, I wanted to ask Zane if there were any questions that came up that um, I don't. Uh, oh, here's the chat. Yep, looks like there is one okay. question. Oh, yeah, I got this. Okay. So, does a homeopathic doctor need both a traditional medical degree and additional homeopathic training? Um, there are many lay homeopaths. They're, they're, uh, people who practice homeopathy who don't have a formal medical training, uh, but they do have a homeopathic training. And in some of those schools, they do include some phys physiology and an anatomy. Um, but as far as licensing goes, they may not be able to uh, practice legally in some states. Uh, if the state has a law against homeopathy or naturopathy, which some states do, then they wouldn't be able to practice. Um, but some of the best homeopaths in the world are lay homeopaths. So they, they often have a gift for um, and a, a wonderful intuitive sense and are wonderful practitioners. I guess that second question is the same question. <laughs> okay, all right. Any other questions before I go on and start with the remedies? Okay. Close that and, and here we go. Do the pictures on my screen block the slides at all for anybody? Zane, can you answer that? I don't have an issue on my end. Okay, so they're not, they're just blocking it for me. Okay. Okay, so the first, so you can see the word at the top clearly because half of it's blocked for me. Okay. So the first remedy we're going to talk about, and these are actually in alphabetical order as we go, is Aconitum napolis. Aconite, um, it's called monk's hood. And as, if you look at the flower here, can you see my arrow, by the way? Okay, so if you look at the uh, flower, it looks like a little monk, doesn't it? A little hood. So that's why it's called monk's hood. So this remedy is a remedy that's often used for um, something that has a sudden onset, like a cold or a flu, um, or maybe they've been out in a dry, cold wind and they, the next day, start sneezing and coughing and, and, and getting sick. So dry cold wind can be the initiation or um, maybe a fright um, has initiated their uh, illness. They may have a fear of death or a panic attack. They are anxious and restless. They may have an intense thirst and with a fever, they'll have hot, dry skin rather than sweaty. That's a, just a brief picture of somebody who might need aconitum as their remedy. This is Allium sepa, common onion. And we all know what it's like when you're peeling an onion and your there's little particles float around and your eyes start weeping and burning and so on. This is one of the proving symptoms of onion. Onion uh, or allium, 
patient who needs allium, uh, uh, gets a headache when they have a cold and they're worse in a warm room, they're better in open air. If you ever had the flu or a cold and you're all stuffed up and you just want to open up a door in the middle of winter and breathe that cold air and it relieves you, that's, that would be an allium symptom. Um, headache, worse closing the eyes because you know there's irritation in the eyes profuse tearing of the eyes. And it's usually a bland discharge in the eyes and the nasal discharge will be acrid or excoriating the uh, sore under the nose. Uh, so hay fever is um, something, a condition that might respond well to allium sepa or any kind of a cold that has this constellation of symptoms. Apis mellifica, this is the honeybee. And the honeybee is often used uh, for any kind of condition that looks like a bee sting. So we have redness, swelling, pain. Um, it's actually a pink red, pinkish red, not a bright red uh, for apis. Uh, it can be given for anything that produces those kind of symptoms. So even a sunburn, for example, which is red and sore and sometimes gets itchy. Uh, insect bites and hives. These would be uh, conditions that would warrant possibly uh, apis for the remedy. Uh, the skin, like I said, can be bright pink. And it's not bright red, it's more of a pinkish red. Better with cold applications, worse with heat. You notice my little uh, marks, the, the, the arrow going forward is better and the arrow going backward is worse. So worse with heat. And DDX means differentially diagnosed. So um, I have a differential diagnosis for LEADM, um, another remedy which, um, can be used for insect bites, puncture wounds, and uh, symptoms of cold, but the cold, um, they might have, uh, it might even be something like a sprained ankle, but the foot is cold. This, that's the unique thing about Leadum. Uh, so if it doesn't have the coldness, it's probably not Leadum. So here we have Arnica Montana. Arnica is probably my most favorite remedy of all because it is so useful. <laughs> it is for uh, trauma and pain and bruising and bleeding and um, this remedy was discovered by observing the goats on the hillside. And when they got injured, they would go and eat this plant and it was the Arnica plant and it would restore them from whatever injury they had. So it's a great remedy for any kind of trauma, falls, accidents, surgery, um, fractures, bruising, muscular aches. It's also a good remedy for shock. Um, and the after the emotional um, aftermath of, of a trauma. Um, princess and the pea, the bed is too hard, no comfortable place, they can't get comfortable. They're worse from touch and jarring and exertion and better from cold applications. And they're better from sitting or lying outstretched. Um, one of my dramatic Arnica cases was when my daughter was giving birth to my first grandson and I happened to be there and he, um, when he came out, he had the cord around his neck and he was blue. He recovered fairly quickly and with every aspect except they couldn't get his temperature up to normal. So of course I had my homeopathy kit with me there and asked if I could use a remedy and they, the doctor and the midwife both said yes. So I asked uh, someone to get me some distilled water and an eyedropper and I just let the remedy uh, dissolve for a few minutes in the water and I put a little squirt of that in the baby's mouth 
And within 25 seconds, his temperature was normal. And this was after over half an hour of trying to get it to get him to warm up. And they were going to take him away from my daughter who objected to him being taken away. So that's when I asked about the remedy. Uh, subsequently, that doctor went and studied homeopathy for two years and the midwife became a naturopath and a homeopath. So it was actually a very uh, uh, a great lesson <laughs> for all of us. to do. This is um, arsenicum. Arsenicum album is arsenic. And this is what arsenic looks like in its mineral form. Arsenicum is a wonderful remedy for many, many things, but particularly for uh, gastrointestinal issues, uh, especially brought on by, uh, you know, food poisoning, or just from eating and drinking that doesn't agree with somebody. There can be acute diarrhea, be watery and excoriating or irritating um, uh, with the diarrhea. It can be for a rash of sudden onset, better with heat. Now that's a peculiar thing about Arnica that it's better with heat um, to have a rash of something that's, you know, tends to be warm and better with heat is unusual. Um, a lot of anxiety uh, with flus and colds, it can be a low grade fever. They tend to be chilly. They tend to be fairly fastidious and orderly and they love consolation. Uh, they can be proud, but dependent and needy. It's a great hay fever, asthma remedy, especially if there's restlessness. If there's a sore throat, they like warm drinks. They have burning pains often that are better with heat. So we call these um, SRPs, strange, rare, and peculiar symptoms. When somebody has a burning pain, it is unusual for them to want a hot compress, but this remedy might have that. And they have a thirst, but they have trouble assimilating water or liquids. So they might just take a sip. And sometimes if you go into the, the, the room of a patient who's sick with, um, in, our, in, in a, our Senecum state, you'll see three or four glasses of drinks and there's only a few sips out of each. So they, they want something to drink, but they can't drink very much, very hard for them to drink. Arsenicum constitutionally, I'll just add uh, uh, a note about constitutional prescribing uh, here because, um, and, and we tend to use higher potency remedies, especially with the emotional state and the sleep state and the dream state. Um, but it's a great remedy for people who are dying because uh, a lot of times there's a lot of anxiety and this remedy can actually help them to cross over with much more peace. So it's uh, often considered constitutionally for somebody who's, who's making that transition. Belladonna. Belladonna is deadly nightshade, you probably know. Uh, Belladonna is used in conventional medicine for stomach problems, uh, vomiting and, and uh, gastrointestinal upsets. We can use it for that in homeopathy as well. Like aconitum, the first remedy we talked about tonight, belladonna can have the sudden onset of a symptom, colds, sore throats, ear infections, lots of head congestion, high fever. They can even be delirious, intense sweating, and of course our, our Aconite has, uh, will get a high temperature, but without the perspiration, they're, they're dry. So belladonna can go either way, but if it's, there's a lot of sweating, it's more likely to be belladonna. There's a great sensitivity to noise and light and the pupils are often dilated. In the old days, the women would go to a, you know, go to the ball and then put a drop of belladonna in their eyes to make the eyes bright and shiny and dilate the pupils because they thought that looked more beautiful. 
course they probably couldn't see very well, <laughs> but uh, that's what they did. So um, dilated pupils with a fever, that glassy eyed look is a real good keynote for knowing that belladonna is needed. Also throbbing pain. If you see a little star beside a symptom, that's a keynote. So throbbing pain. And the time of day when they tend to be worse is 3 p.m., three in the afternoon. How many times if you have children, um, they wake up fine and by three in the afternoon, they start having a fever. And that would be, a, you know, you should consider belladonna in that case. This is Bryonia, Bryonia alba. And off, uh, what's used for the remedies is the root, which you see here. And Bryonia is a great flu remedy. It's one of the top flu remedies. Uh, so for changes of season, this might be a remedy that's called for when uh, people tend to get sick. With Bryonia, there's intense thirst for cold drinks. There is fatigue. They have uh, headaches with the aching uh, and knife-like pain. Bryonia is worse with motion of any kind. And in fact, they like hard pressure because they're trying to keep the part still. So let's say they've injured their arm. They might just hold themselves tight so that so, so that it doesn't move. Or if they have a cough, they'll hold onto their ribs so they don't move. So better with pressure, worse with motion, uh, better lying on the affected part for the same reason that puts pressure. And their worst time is, tends to be nine o'clock in the, in the evening. They tend to be worse with warmth and worse with light touch, better with hard pressure. Remedy for post-nasal drip. Yes, we'll come to one. Okay, well, just want to check the messages there. Okay. So now we have Calcarea carbonica. This was actually the remedy for that little boy that came in with the asthma that I talked about. This is a very common remedy. It's a big children's remedy, uh, constitutionally. Um, children that are more chilly and tire easily. They might have perspiration on the head and on the feet. And the perspiration often has a sour, sweaty, uh, the sour has sour smell. And their stools can too. Stools can be kind of greenish and, and sour smelling. Um, with the constipation that they tend to have, they have large stools and often plug the toilet, even little children. Um, they can be a little bit stubborn and they don't like change. So a child who uh, might play quietly doing something and his mom comes along and says, okay, it's time to go. And he resists because he wants to finish what he's doing. They don't like change. <laughs> they, they like to finish what they're doing and take it slow. So that's sort of the, you know, the nature of this uh, Calcarea carbonica child. Uh, they're worse with cold, they're worse with change of weather and after exertion. And in some peculiar cases, they're better with constipation for some reason. And they're better with warmth and better with dry weather. So here we have chamomilla. We all know the story of Peter Rabbit, right? Chamomile for his little cold, made him feel better in the morning. This is a great remedy for children who are teething, they're irritable and fussy. They have a fever maybe, and maybe an earache. And all this often comes with teething. A keynote to chamomile is that one cheek might be red and the other cheek pale. Their discharges from the nose or stool are greenish like calcarea. And we often will di differentially diagnose this remedy with pulsatilla because it has a very similar 
look as chamomilla <clears throat> um, pulsatilla tends to be more mild chamomilla more irritable and with pulsatilla the discharge is a more yellowish but um and pulsatilla is one of those remedies for post nasal drip it's a good one for that Okay, let's see. China officinalis. This is cinchona bark. This is the remedy that Dr. Hahnemann first uh, proved by taking it. And it's the remedy for malaria and the symptoms that resemble malaria. Uh, cinchona bark or China, uh, or Peruvian bark as it's called, um, can be a good bleeding remedy. Uh, it's bleeding that causes weakness. So whether it's menstrual bleeding or nasal bleeding, any kind of bleeding that causes a weakness, it's actually a, a loss of any fluid. So it could be that uh, just losing a lot of fluid from other reasons uh, would uh, cause some weakness. That might be a China or a cinchona bark case. Um, one way we lose a lot of fluids is with diarrhea, and this can cause weakness. It would be a painless diarrhea uh, for this remedy. Um, other remedies might have a lot of pain with the diarrhea. Throbbing in the head uh, with headache, and it's usually on the top of the head, the vertex. There can be colic, like gallstones that cause that nausea feeling. Uh, in general, they're worse after eating, uh, worse with the slightest touch and drafts, and they're better from warmth, better from bending double, better from open air and hard pressure like rayonia. So hopefully you're getting the idea of how you might uh, differentiate with another remedy. If you remember, okay, there was another remedy with hard pressure, that was Bryonia. And though I'm gonna show you at the end a way that you can um, do that cross-reference more easily. So than just remembering. <laughs> so, okay, this is coffee, Arabica, Ar Ar Arabian coffee bean, which is what the proving was done with. And as you can imagine, what happens when we drink coffee, we might get a little edgy, we might be, um, you know, unable to relax because it's stimulating. And so we have a whole lineup of symptoms. This remedy might be used for insomnia or restlessness due to exhaustion, overexcitability, the child who's all hyped up because they've been to a birthday party that day and had a whole bunch of sugar and they can't settle down and go to sleep. So you give them coffee and they'll start to relax and, and go to sleep. Um, coffee can be used for intolerance of the pain, whatever pain they're having. And with headaches, their headache is as if a nail is driven into the head. You can imagine one spot, you know. Toothache, better with ice water in the mouth. And waking at three in the morning and then they only doze, sometimes coffee can be given, it will help them get more, a more restful sleep. And we can differentially diagnose the sleep problems with Nux vomica, who lies awake worrying about the next day. And we'll come to Nux vomica later here. Euphrasia officinalis, this is a great remedy for allergies and for that post-nasal drip and watery eyes and all of that. So hay fever, photophobia, but mostly around the eyes, eye bright, that's what it's called. And, but they also have a bland nasal discharge and it's profuse. That can also be a, a post-nasal thing. Ferrum phosphoricum. This is just what it looks like. It's iron. <laughs> so what do we use fer phos for? Uh, we use it for the flu. Early stages with a gradual onset. 
Now, belladonna, if belladonna fails, we can give ferrum foss. But ferrum foss um, differs a little bit in that uh, it's a gradual onset, whereas belladonna can be a sudden onset and aconite can be a sudden onset as well. So often these three remedies are differentiated for something like the flu. Um, the eyes can become red and inflamed uh, with ferrum foss in that state. They can be kind of nervous, sensitive, and anemic, whereas belladonna might be a little more lethargic and, you know, um, Children with a tendency to nosebleed, this might be a remedy for that as well. Nice thing about homeopathy is if you have the wrong remedy, nothing happens usually. So, you know, sometimes we need to try one and then try another, and that's okay. This is gelsemium. Gelsemium is probably the El Primo flu remedy. So again, change of season, the main flu remedy. Um, with gelsemium, we have a weak, dull, droopy, heavy feeling. Uh, I don't know if years ago they had used to have these ads on TV for Dristan, uh, over the counter Dristan. And they'd have a picture of somebody who is obviously really very dull and very, you know, lethargic and droopy and heavy. Uh, they can have some trembling, shivering chills. They're dull and want to be still. They can picture somebody with a blanket wrapped around them, just kind of suffering. They tend to be thirstless, like, um, I was going to say like arsenicum. Arsenicum has trouble drinking, but they're actually kind of thirsty. But this one is thirstless. They really don't want to drink anything. They have a low-grade fever, possibly. They have headaches that radiate to the neck and shoulders. They can get diarrhea from anticipation. Um, I gave this remedy once to somebody who could not get himself to go to the dentist. He had to go to the dentist. I mean, he had an appointment like in 10 minutes and he wasn't gonna go. So I gave him gelsemium and I, before I, I turned around and he was out the door and they're gone. So I took care of that anxiety. So I might prescribe this for somebody who has anxiety about flying also. Um, you know, getting on an airplane, sometimes it can just calm them down. Oftentimes they'll have a little diarrhea from anticipation, uh, test anxiety, and they'll have to go to the bathroom three or four times before they go. And we have somebody on our tennis team who, you know, gets anxious about a match. And so she'll <laughs> run to the bathroom four or five times. So um, anxiety, any kind of anxiety, test anxiety or anxiety about whatever. Uh, with the uh, hay fever, it's that same dullness and the foggy headedness that you see with the flu. The worst time for gelsemium's illness is 10 in the morning. Question, um, would you use eye bright for an eye that tears with the wind and chemical smells? I think it's worth a try. Like I said, you can try it if it works great. If it doesn't, um, uh, worse with wind could be uh, aconitum as well. So that, that might be another option for, for that symptom. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Hypericum. Hypericum perforatum. This is St. John's wort. And you may know St. John's wort is a nervine, it means it affects the nervous system. And this is often um, used as part of a uh, depression, uh, which you know affects our nervous system, our brain. Um, but it also on the physical level can help to heal injuries near nerve endings um, and trauma involving nerve pain a tooth extraction, a crushed finger, a deep pinprick, puncture wound, shooting pain, sciatica, extreme pain, uh, worse with cold, with dampness, with touch, with pressure, with movement, 
Um, hypericum can be used on broken skin. And I, I might add that Arnica, which we studied in the very beginning here, uh, should not be used on broken skin. So if you have some Arnica with ointment or cream or gel, which it comes in, um, it should not be used on broken skin, but hypericum can be used on broken skin. It won't irritate the way Arnica would. So I have a little hypericum story, uh, a friend who was skiing with her husband and she was um, had taken my first aid prescribing class years ago, this happened years ago. Um, so they were skiing and her husband who happened to be a doctor uh, ripped a fingernail uh, part way off and it was very, very painful. So he had snow wrapped around it and she was running to get her homeopathy kit and came back and and brought hypericum and tossed it in his mouth. And he, he told me this story later and he said, she had no sooner put that remedy in his mouth that had barely hit his tongue. And he said, the pain was gone. And so he became a, a real believer in homeopathy. He was quite skeptical in the beginning when his wife was learning homeopathy, but became a, <laughs> became a, a real, um, supporter of homeopathy. Thanks to Hypericum. Ignatia Amara. Now Ignatia is a remedy that is wonderful for grief. It's a big grief remedy. It's St. Ignatius bean. So these are beans here. <clears throat> it, Ignatia, the Ignatius state, in the Ignatius state, they tend to have contradictory symptoms. So they might be, for example, nauseous, but they're better with eating. Makes no sense, does it? But that's the way Ignatia is. So, um, Oversensitive to emotions, to pain, to odors, especially tobacco and perfumes, things like that. A lot of sighing and yawning with this grief, um, they can be actually irritable with their grief. Um, they can become withdrawn from fright. They can have wandering pains or paresthesias. Um, they also have headaches as if a nail is driven through the side of the head and they're very intolerant of the pain. One of the tip offs for this remedy is when somebody, for example, um, has grief or a sore throat, can feel like they have a lump in their throat. And they'll say, can't swallow. You know, they can't, they've got this lump in their throat. And sometimes it's emotional and sometimes it's physical with a sore throat. Um, they also are better with cold air. Just do a check in with how we're doing. Okay, we're a little bit behind, but let's see if we can. Finish these. Um, Ipecac is our next remedy. And you probably know Ipecac is kept in the house for people who have some kind of poisoning and it will cause them to vomit, right? So homeopathically, we would use it for somebody who has vomiting and maybe difficulty not vomiting, you know, stopping the vomiting. So, um, and with the nausea, they will have a lot of salivation. That is a keynote for Ipecac, uh, this hypersalivation. They might have a cold sweat. So a big flu remedy when there's nausea and you know that sweaty uh, salivating with prior to vomiting. It can also be used for bleeding with when there's bright red blood, gushes of bright red blood, nosebleed or whatever kind of bleeding um, that's profuse. Uh, somebody with a bad cough, they may cough until they vomit, like with asthma, um, could use this remedy as well. This is the Bushmaster snake. It's all, uh, also called Lachesis muta. I think that's Latin maybe. Um, and this snake is very useful as a homeopathic remedy. The very, very intense, the person in a lack of state is very intense, intensity of everything. 
with the headache, it's a pressure headache, it's a bursting headache. They might have boils, but they're bursting, you know, they're like painful, acne, a sore throat, but it's gonna be painful. They're hot, worse with heat. They're worse on waking. The person in a lack of state will often wake into their symptoms. So they wake up with a headache in the morning or wake up with a whatever symptom. It's a great PMS remedy, uh, premenstrual syndrome, and it's often a left-sided remedy. And it's interesting because when the Bushmaster snake crawls, it kind of goes to the left like that. Uh, so it's a big left-sided remedy. Question, do you use certain remedies for COVID or does it depend on the individual? Uh, it would depend on the symptoms. We'd use them in the same way so that if their symptoms were more gastrointestinal, we'd use remedies that have that aspect. If they were more headachey and, um, you know, we'd use more remedies for that. So again, you take the case based on the symptoms and you apply the remedy that matches. Good question. Okay. Next is... Lycopodium clavatum, lycopodium is club moss. This is a very common moss here in New Hampshire. You'll see it in the woods, kind of viney like moss. This is a great remedy for digestive problems, gas and bloating and loud rumbling in the abdomen, sour burps or irritations, heartburn. Uh, the worst time of day is four to eight in the afternoon, early, early evening. That's a classic time where they get, you know, uncomfortable. Um, on the constitutional side, somebody who's in a like a podium state can be kind of a, have a personality that's domineering and a bit of uh, bullying, but it's usually due to a lack of self-confidence. Again, that's on the constitutional side. You don't you wouldn't necessarily see that with somebody who's just suffering from gastrointestinal problems. But if you're, I just wanted to throw in a few uh, aspects for constitutional prescribing just for your information. Uh, this is a right-sided remedy. So their symptoms will tend to be on the right, of course. Mercury, Mercurius solubilis, solubilis, and it's named Hanumani because he did the proving for this early on because this was one of the remedies that they commonly used that was so toxic it would often do the patient in. With mercury, there's intense salivation, mercury poisoning, or if somebody's in a mercury state is how we term it. Um, like Ipecac, the salivation is there. So, you know, but there's other things with mercury. It's, uh, uh, it's got, uh, it's very, very chilly. It's uh, worse with temperature changes. They're very sensitive to drafts. They're worse with perspiration. Um, they can have open sores. It's a very syphilitic state a very deep state. So these open sores, pus and greenish discharges, boils. So taking this remedy, you know, Hahnemann almost killed himself a few times taking uh, too high a dose when he was sampling some of these remedies. Uh, boils can be a, a part of a mercurious state, foul odors, sore throat with much pain. Could be a lot of bad breath with that sore throat. Ear infections that are, you know, goopy and a lot of pus, uh, symptoms are worse at night. Nature muriatica is salt of the sea. So this is a great remedy for colds with a lot of sneezing and watery nasal discharge. Uh, that's usually the consistency of egg white and irritates the nose. The nose can be stopped up and there can be a loss of the sense of smell or taste. So, I mean, this might be worth trying for somebody who's lost the smell and taste from COVID, actually. I would give it a try. I haven't, haven't hadn't thought of that until I was preparing this slideshow. So <laughs> I might try that with a few patients now. Uh, worst with a warm room. Again, they like to put their head outside in the cold. 
uh, when they have all this sneezing and uh, stuffiness. Their worst time is 10 in the morning, kind of like gelsemium, remember? And they're also worse from noise. They're like quiet. Um, this is also a grief remedy. This often is the chronic, like somebody who's Ignatia, the, in the Ignatia state that we studied earlier on today, tonight, um, is a grief remedy. And Nature Muriaticum is very, um, very much like a constitutional or a, a, for the chronic state of uh, grief, um, big grief remedy. Disappointments, brooding, worse consolation, and they can be sleepless from their grief, really. And they withdraw, they kind of withdraw. Nux vomica, this is poison nut. Let's see, it's what it looks like here. This is a big digestive remedy and usually from excess eating and drinking. Uh, it can be heartburn and nausea and empty retching and sour burps. If they have a headache, there's irritability with it and drowsiness. They tend to be worse in the a.m. in the morning and can this can be a great remedy for a hangover, by the way. Uh, it's also a big remedy constitutionally that we use for addiction. Um, it can really um, lessen the tendency to, um, uh, to use um, a drug, drugs or alcohol. Um, on the digestive side, the diarrhea can be frequent, but small amounts and can be accompanied by a backache. So that is poison nut. Sorry to have to rush through these, but uh, I wanted to cover uh, an array of remedies for you. But uh, each of these remedies, there are pages and pages on each remedy. So there's a lot more to it, but for acute prescribing, this hits some of the highlights for you. Uh, phosphorus is phosphorus. <laughs> it needs to be kept under water because it catches fire spontaneously on exposure to air. Um, very effervescent, very uh, spontaneous. And the phosphorus constitutionally is very um, animated. Um, for our purposes, phosphorus uh, is a big bleeding remedy, uh, can be bleeding from the nose or the gums, heavy menses, um, small wounds that bleed profusely with bright red blood. Uh, it's also a good remedy for coughs, coughs that can have chest pain. Um, they're worse with motion, worse with cold air and laughing. Uh, worse from lying, especially on the left side. And laryngitis, big laryngitis, hoarseness rest, uh, remedy. They tend to crave ice cold drinks, kind of like Brionia. And they're worse being alone and worse in the dark. Phosphorus can have a lot of fears, which is why they don't like to be alone or in the dark. So big remedy for laryngitis and for bleeding and for coughs and lung issues. And a high thirst. This is pulsatilla. This is windflower, little purple flower. Pulsatilla is a great PMS remedy. It's a big remedy for ear infections in children, especially when they're mild mannered kind of kids, so shy, sweet, placid. They like to be held. Whereas chamomilla that we compared it to before, they want to be held, but as soon as they're held, they want to get down. And then when they're down, they want up. That's chamomilla. Pulsatilla is more content to be held and they're not so irritable. They can be weepy though. The nasal discharges are thick yellow to green. They tend to be worse at night and from a warm room, they can have pressure in their ear. They want fresh air and they can be thirstless. Even with a high fever, they tend not to want to drink. Rust toxicodendron, this is poison ivy. You notice the three leaves. 
Now, <clears throat> so rust toxic, rust toxicodendron or rust tox, we call it, is the big flu remedy. A lot of aching, you know, aches and pains, um, stiffness uh, that go with the flu. This is, um, these are keynotes for using rust tox. Uh, they're restless, they move constantly to find a comfortable position. It's used for strains and sprains. Um, they're better with first motion. So if somebody who's in a rust talk state, they'll get up and they'll be stiff and trying to move. And as they move, they feel better. And then towards the end of the day, as they get tired, then they don't want to move again. They have more pain with motion. So um, they have a thirst for cold water or milk. They like milk. That's kind of a peculiar thing. And it was that symptom, the desire for milk, craving for milk, actually, that led me to this remedy for one of my asthma cases. And it cured her asthma just like that, the 15-year-old girl. <clears throat> um, let's see. Better with heat, better with continued motion. <clears throat> Now, some people use this for poison ivy. I tend to use another remedy for poison ivy first. It's anacardium. We're not gonna, not gonna be doing that remedy, but <clears throat> uh, I don't usually use rust tox because sometimes it aggravates it and makes it worse. I, I, that's been my experience. Oh, here's the question. Is it possible to cure someone from severe poison ivy reactions? <clears throat> I believe so. I believe so. Can poison ivy be used for a remedy if you are a person who's allergic to it? Yeah, so I, I, I tend to use anacardium instead just because I've, I've seen it aggravate um, poison ivy, as I said. Okay. And one case of poison ivy I had, it was really pervasive. Of this, this, this was a, actually a doctor that came in to see me who had uh, poison ivy. She was a friend of mine. And she um, had taken prednisone and it didn't do a thing. Surprise. So I uh, gave her, I took her a constitutional case and gave her staphysagria. And she called me the next day and she said, I'm 50% better. And she continued to improve after that. So, so yeah, you use the remedy that you take it into consideration uh, all aspects of the person. And she was in a um, I don't think we're doing staphysagria today, but, um, but she was in a staphysagria state. So, um, let's see. Sepia officinalis. Sepia is squid ink. That was a squid, in case you didn't recognize it. <laughs> squid ink, the ink of a squid. Um, this is a great remedy for female problems. Constitutionally, we use it all the time for women with hormonal issues, uh, hot flashes and all kinds of things. But it's also a great uh, remedy for urinary tract problems such in, in bedwetting uh, in kids or anyone. Uh, if there's a rash that's dry and has small blisters and scaling and brownish, that can be a sepia uh, rash. And it's a big remedy for herpetic uh, eruptions. Um, no distinguishing features were given. Uh, Nature muriaticum also can be used for herpetic eruptions. Um, yeah, just in general. Silicia or silica, terra, this is, um, the silica is like glass, you know, a sand. Uh, the silica person tends to be physically on the weak side. Oops, I jumped ahead. Uh, when they're, they're, and they're tired when they're sick, they just uh, don't have a lot of stamina. Uh, it's a big remedy for severe ear infections with painful lymph nodes. Uh, those large nodes are a big keynote for silica. And we differentially diagnose that with mercury and help ourselves. Uh, the child is uh, in the silica state tends to be mild and kind of whimpering, less affectionate than pulsatilla. They can have itching in the ears and 
uh, pus and fluid. And also for infections behind the ear and the mastoid bone uh, can respond to silica uh, when the ear stopped up. Now, an infection in the mastoid bone is very, very serious. So um, I would only give this until I could get a consult with uh, a doctor for that person because um, that bone is close to the brain and you don't want that infection to, to go to the brain. So um, there's a cutoff point where an antibiotic might be used, uh, but sometimes silicon can be used at the same time to improve things more quickly. Uh, the silica person is generally chilly. They can have a lot of sinus pain, uh, boils and abscesses uh, that are slow to heal. And that can be differentially diagno uh, diagnosed with hepar sulf and also staphysagria uh, uh, with styes. Silica can get styes and that staphysagria can get styes. Again, we, we don't have staphysagria on this list, but... Um, there it is. Okay, spongia tosta. This is sea sponge. Uh, spongia is a great remedy for laryngitis and for uh, croup in kids, little babies that have croup. Spongia often is the remedy. Aconitum could be the remedy if it came on really quick, but if it doesn't work, spongia. Uh, they respond to uh, warm liquids, uh, getting them in the shower with the moisture and, and uh, it gets into their lungs and calms things down. Laryngitis or throat worse with swallowing. They can have a burning in their nose. Uh, this is another remedy with uh, exposure to the cold weather and drafts, kind of like aconitum where cold, dry wind can bring on uh, this state. They're worse with sleeping. So they'll usually wake up around midnight and be croupy. Also dry asthma with a cough and exhaustion after exertion. Sulfur. They say, if you don't know what to give, give sulfur because sulfur has has more symptoms that it's known to have cured. Something like 9,000 different symptoms have been shown to be cured with this remedy. It's just a very broad remedy. Um, we call it the everything remedy. <laughs> and um, great remedy for flu-like symptoms, beginning stages uh, of the flu can prevent the evolution of the illness. So if you can get them a dose of sulfur right in the beginning of an illness, sometimes it will abort it. Sulfur often has burning pains, um, skin ailments with itching, burning, and redness. Uh, diarrhea, uh, a lot of digestive things too with sulfur. Uh, diarrhea is in the morning, often driving them out of bed. That's a keynote for sulfur. Uh, often they'll have orifices that are red, the eyes, the lips, the anus might be bright red. You see somebody with bright red lips, it's often a sulfur person. Um, they're worse at night, worse with warmth, uh, better with cold air or drafts, worse, uh, worse with cold air, sorry, uh, worse with washing and better open air and warm drinks. Uh, they can be irritable and impatient when they're sick. Uh, I have a relative who uh, would be um, often as constitutionally as sulfur, but when he would get sick, he'd be like pulsatilla. And those are complementary actually remedies. As you get deepened in homeopathy, you find out that certain remedies work well uh, following another particular remedy. Um, Constitutionally, sulfurs can be a little disorganized or muddled. I think of Columbo, you know, the sort of disheveled kind of guy um, can be the, the classic constitutional sulfur. Uh, they tend to be hungry at 11 in the morning. They don't want breakfast earlier than that, but by 11 o'clock, man, they got to eat. Symphytum officinalis, let's see. 
This is, uh, this is our last remedy. Some phytum is knit bone. This remedy is used uh, to help uh, heal uh, old wounds and um, fractures. We don't wanna give it too early, however. Um, we wanna make sure the bone is lined up right. So usually when somebody breaks a the bone, they'll have a checkup within a few days to make sure it's starting to knit in the right place. And once it's, we know that, then we can give some, some phytum to speed up the healing process. So it's also great for a trauma to the eye from a blow from a blunt object. So like a basketball hitting somebody in the eye. Um, somebody with prickling of old wounds or amputations. This is uh, apparently uh, used for that. That's, has, I haven't ever used it for that myself. Uh, pain of bony areas like the ankles or the elbows or the knees or neuralgia of the knee. Uh, wounds to the perineum um, and anal itching, at that whole area can be uh, symphytum, soothed by symphytum. Uh, in the symphytum state, they are worse with touch and motion and pressure, kind of like brainonia. And they're better with gentle motion and warmth. So that takes us through 30 remedies. And I wanted to give you a few references. This is a little hard to read, but um, Judith, uh, uh, Judith Reichenberg Allman and her husband, Robert Allman, who were two of my wonderful homeopathy teachers in naturopathic medical school, wrote these books and many other books. They wrote Ritalin Free Kids um, and several other uh, great books, Homeopathic Self-Care. Um, these are available out there online and so on. Also this little book, the Materia Medica, I have one here. Uh, this is a great little starter book if you want to um, uh, do cross-referencing of remedies. The first half of the book is Materia Medica and the second half of the book is the repertory. So the Materia Medica, each remedy is described and listed and described in more detail than we covered today. And they give, um, you know, the application for each, you know, part of the body, like the head and the, the, the lungs and the throat, stomach and abdomen, stool, extremities and fever. So you might see two or three pages on each remedy in this book. Um, the second half of the book is the repertory and the repertory is a list of symptoms and all the remedies known to have cured that symptom. So there can be anywhere from one or two remedies known to have cured that symptom, or there can be a hundred. Um, and then, so you can take each of your symptoms and repertorize it and see which remedy keeps coming up for most of those symptoms. And then that might be the remedy that you would want to use. So this is a very useful little book. It's very compact and you can carry it with you. Um, I really like and appreciate that book. We also have major repertories, um, computerized now and so on. Um, Kayla wants to know if any recommendations for infant remedies uh, such as books. There are books on pediatrics out there uh, but most of these, you know, you can apply the same principles to children, to babies, as you do to anybody. Um, and some of these acute remedies that we've gone over today, are the, those are some of the most used remedies. Really, one of my homeopathic teachers said, 80% of all things can be dealt with with these 100 remedies that he presented to us. So, so uh, and I lean heavily on those remedies and they do work. And some of these more obscure remedies that, you know, you want to treat with, what is it? Horses, not uh, whatever that saying is. Um, can't remember now. So this is a remedy by Dana Allman, no relation to the other almonds, but uh, Dana Allman wrote prolifically as well, Everybody's Guide to Homeopathic Medicine. Um, and so this is another book that you can find out there on Amazon or some of these websites. 
So any other questions that you have, uh, we can take a few minutes and answer questions. If there are no questions, then I will say thank you to all of you for your attention and for joining us tonight and for your interest in uh, homeopathy. I'd love to see that it's still alive and well out there in people's minds and hearts. And um, uh, I wish you well in your journey. Looks like if you're, we might have one question actually. It just popped oh, into the I chat. See. Okay, I just see. Let's see. What is your go-to for a child with severe eczema? Okay, so again, you wanna take the case, find out, is it weeping? Is it dry? Where is it? Where did it start? Where is it going? What is the child like? I would take their whole case constitutionally. Um, I mean, eczema is a pretty, it's not an acute illness. It's a constitutional, it's a, it's a chronic illness generally. So I would take a chronic case or a constitutional case and see what is the nature of that child? Uh, what are their preferences? Do they, are they thirsty? Or are they not thirsty? Are they thirsty for uh, cold drinks with ice in it? Or did they like warm drinks? Um, you know, how is their sleep? How is their bowel function? All of these things. So I would treat and find, look for their constitutional remedy which could be any one of these. Um, and I would also look at their diet and nutrition and, and work with that end of it too and their immune system and maybe use some herbal things along with homeopathics, immune support. Okay. What is your go for pain on teething? Okay. Uh, extreme pain with, we do chamomile and it doesn't touch the pain. Okay, the second remedy that I would consider is calcarea carbonica because the teeth are calcium, they're calcified. Mm -hmm. And that remedy often will be the one that will, will help a teething child. But then I'll also look at their temperament. Um, you know, some of the characteristics might help me to determine exactly which remedy it is. Uh, 10 month old for reference, okay, yeah, okay. Very good. Any other questions? Okay. Well, again, thank you all. And um, are you taking clients? Uh, yes, I am. I am taking new clients. Uh, I do telemedicine though. Um, I have a, a HIPAA compliant program and, and we just talk over that. We can see each other and um, and I treat that way. So um, my email is drpamelaherring at gmail.com. If you want to email me and send me your phone number, I'll get back to you. Awesome. And I also put my email in the chat there in case anyone is interested in those remedy kits. Um, it's uh, zane at conqueredfoodcoop.coop. And uh, you can also give us a call at the store and ask for me and I'd be happy to talk to you over the phone as well. Um, thank you so much to Dr. Herring. Thank you to all of you for coming. Um, I'd just like to look forward a little bit on April 21st, we'll be having our next class, which is the first of a three part series with Julianne Hartley about seasonal foraging. Um, so we'll talk about um, foraging through uh, all different seasons as, right before they happen. Um, so we'll be uh, ready to go. So th that event is live on Eventbrite, just how you signed up for this one. Um, we'll be talking about it a little bit more uh, over the next month, and we look forward to seeing you then as well. Thank you, everyone. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. If you're in the mood for real food, it's Conquered Food Co-op.